Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only access, and by the Holy Spirit whom you have given us, who intercedes on our behalf. Just thankful, grateful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to take and look upon your word, to feast upon it. I just ask that you would filter out, strike out all error, all foolishness, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Well, if you've been following us along uh, in these videos that we've been doing here, we've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were well into chapter 8 of, of the Epistle to the Romans. The magnificent extent of God's amazing grace from chapter 1 to where we're at now in chapter 8 has been, to me, it's been almost overwhelming and difficult to even contemplate. We've seen a lot loved by God, given the gift of grace, made and called saints, given peace with God, given the very, made the very righteousness of God in Christ, assured that the righteousness of God in, in Jesus Christ will reign unto eternal life. And all of this based upon the faithfulness and the obedience of Christ being justified freely by his grace. Justified, the word justified means made righteous, were that we establish the law through grace, that we are children of promise to all the seed. It's assured that we've been blessed, given hope, given a sure standing in grace, given complete access to God's grace made to persevere, given character, deliverance, reconciliation. We've been reconciled to God. And if that isn't enough, made dead to sin through our death with Christ, buried and raised with Christ in our, our identification with Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, where we then walk in newness of life, his life, not in our own strength, the flesh, law, not according to law, but grace since there is nothing good in the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. And that despite that conflict between old man and new man, flesh and spirit, deliverance is promised. It's assured us. Victory is assured through Jesus Christ. He always leads us to triumph. Or that there's absolutely now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Or that we serve beneath an entirely different principle, which the Bible calls the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which has made us free from the law of sin and death because of the weakness of the flesh. And so many Christians struggle with the flesh. Though the law is righteous, just, and holy, there's nothing wrong with the law. The problem is with us. That, this spirit, that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is intimately connected to the, this principle of life. It's connected to the same power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, delivered from the bondage of fear and failure and guilt, the spirit bearing witness with our spirit of these many, many truths, through the Word of God itself, the intimate relationship and closeness, fellowship that we have with our Father and with Jesus Christ and with the Holy Spirit as, as our Father's beloved children, heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ. I mean, it, it just never seems to end the blessings. That our present suffering in flesh and spirit is not compared not to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. That the creation itself 
anxiously awaits with patience our final deliverance by Jesus Christ and the redemption of our physical bodies were that they will be made like unto his and revealed, the, the revealing of the sons of God, that's us, revealed before all of creation. So when we look deeply into these many glorious truths, we discover that we are indeed treading on holy ground. We see just how gracious and how loving and how merciful our God is, is and how he's dealing with us from every angle and at every turn in our lives. A divine love letter of grace and truth and blessing stacked upon blessing, upon blessing, upon blessing, where that the blessings continue to pour forth in great abundance from the Word of God because, because He loves us, because of the great love that He has for us. In this video, we'll be looking at verses 20 through 22 through 28. In my last video, I pointed out that God compares this adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies to childbirth. If we begin reading at verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And that the meaning of the phrase first fruits of the Spirit refers to the fullness of the Holy Spirit which we have received, which we've been given. We haven't just been given part of Him. He whom Jesus referred to as the comforter that he said that he would send, that he would come. Verse 23, and not only they, but also, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. We've seen that the text clearly reveals that we will not be disembodied spirits in heaven fellowshipping with the Savior in a risen body, in a resurrected body. See my hands and my feet, that it, it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So, we are children by birth, but sons by adoption. And the word adoption, as I pointed out, is eschatological, the redemption of our bodies, at which time the conflict described in Romans 7, folks, O wretched man I am, will be gone. It'll be gone. The text does not say that we're saved by hope. I pointed that out. The original text uses the word for. We are saved for hope or into the realm of hope. And that's not wishful thinking, you know, meaning guaranteed expectation. We were delivered into the realm of certainty as it regards the redemption of our bodies, which we now do not see. I believe that's what the text is teaching us. Verse 24, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? So we were delivered into the realm of certainty as it regards the redemption of our bodies that we now do not see. And by means of, the word there in the Greek is dia, or through patience, that is, and the word for patience is steadfast endurance in situations that we don't control, then we wait for it. You know, it's not difficult to endure in situations that we control. It's another thing altogether to 
endure, steadfastly endure in situations that we don't control. Folks, our lives are in God's hands, not ours. Yes, it, the word infirmities is singular, and it, it's a present middle passive or middle voice. It means weakness or infirmities. It's weakness. It's a sing. It's and the word is singular. Singular weakness. We see constant intercession. The Holy Spirit never ceases to intercede on our behalf. Is what we're seeing in the text. We just don't have the ability to communicate with God properly. The word no, there is oida, perfect tense. We never have known how to pray. The common word for prayer there in the original text is, I believe, you know, related to worship. Note that it's not the Holy Spirit that's groaning. The Holy Spirit doesn't groan. What he does is he translates our groanings. I think we have to realize the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Unlike before the indwelling, before Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit would come upon God's people temporarily for service and then depart. Wouldn't serve any purpose whatsoever for us to be walking by sight, not by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Our attention is drawn away from our circumstances here to things above. Set your affection on things above, not on things below. Verse 25, but if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us which with groanings which cannot be uttered this is basically where we left off and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of god now the likewise there in the text or, you know, if you're using the authorized version, or in the same way, it points back to what was said previously. It took me a while to go back and look at that and see, you know, what is the likewise? That in the same way that the Spirit testifies with our spirit, He helps us in our infirmities. And if you look in the original text, you will you will see that, that that is not plural. The word is infirmities. Is the word is singular. I think we ought to take note of that word and that that conjunction says that, that this is tied intimately with what was written beforehand, what was written prior. The word no there, the perfect. Uh, tense of, of no, oida, it stresses the present reality of a past fact. We perfectly know and that, that that represents that God has revealed all we need to know in this book. We don't need to go outside to, to some external source to know what God has said. We don't know by looking at present circumstances, particularly our walk in the flesh, or, you know, the manifestations of the flesh, the, the old man, the sin nature. Can't judge by that. The word good is agathos in the Greek, meaning beautiful design. But folks, we look at the tangled side of that. No, it, we can't quit loving God. We love him because he first loved us. That the idea that God can't make you love him, and I've heard this people say that, oh, well, Steve, God can't make you love him. Folks, that is biblically false. And God would have to stop loving you for you to stop loving him, and he's not going to do that. 
and he loves you because he called you according to purpose. The word he is is not there in the original text. It's not according to his purpose, even though I, I suppose that you it wouldn't. I don't have a problem with, you know, you putting the word his in there, but I'm just pointing out that it's not there in the original text. In fact, you'll, you'll notice it's italicized in the uh, authorized version. He called you according to purpose. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God called us according to purpose. Our lives have purpose, and God has established and determined that glorious purpose and he reveals that purpose in his word. We've been bought with a price. That's the meaning behind the word redemption. The temptation, I believe, is, is great on the part of many Christians to not believe that, well, you know, not all things really work together for the good. You know, not all. But it doesn't say, folks, it doesn't say some things or most things or even all particularly related things or, you know, it doesn't say all church related things or, or all spiritual things and, and, you know, and perhaps, you know, a few physical things, but, you know, mostly all things, but not really all things. That's not what the text says. It does not infer only the good things, but must include the so-called bad things, at least bad from our human perspective. All things, and this is, it's because all things are related to God's design and purpose for our lives. Nothing is wasted. If it says anything, what it says is that it includes those things which we would sometimes likely not believe were part of his plan and purpose. So it includes all things. All things work together for the good. Therefore, that must include so-called failure, failures as well as successes. And this is not conditional. It's not based upon our continuing to love God. Well, Steve, what, what if I don't, what if I don't, what if I stop loving God? We love God because he first loved us. Personally, and I, I don't ask anyone to really agree with me on this. I believe that looking at all of this in context, considering everything that's gone before, and the groaning and pain, the travail, the suffering, the infirmity, the, the all things are all directly and intimately tied or connected or related, not just to that conflict between flesh and spirit, which I believe is the immediate context, but to all of these many truths pertaining to God's grace in our lives themselves and the opposition that the truth encounters, the opposition that we encounter with the world religious system as, as a whole, as a result of those truths. That's the groaning. It's true that we groan and travail as with, as with birth pains to be delivered from this body of sin and corruption. That's, that's absolutely true. That's the reason why we know not what we should pray for, as we ought. Where the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered by us. How many times have you found yourself just groaning? Oh. Or that he must translate our groanings. It's because of where we find ourselves in this life, walking upon such holy ground of grace, tremendous grace, the grace of God that we have seen and been given by our loving God. I find myself groaning in myself constantly. 
not knowing what to pray for. I look around, I see what's going on in the world and in the world religious system. And again, I've, I've often found myself saying, I just, I don't, I can't put it into words how I feel. I just don't know how to explain why things are the, the way that they are. And God understands this, folks. He understands this. We, This is why we have Him interceding on our behalf. If I've seen anything with you folks ever, you know, since the beginning of this study in Romans, if I've seen anything at all, what I've seen is God the Holy Spirit putting His foot on the gas, both feet on the gas, right from the start, of grace and not letting up, going full speed, not letting up. And I don't believe it. we'll ever see that. I don't, know. I don't think that we will ever come to a chapter in this study or a book in this Bible that will ever show the, the slowing down of, of those tremendous blessings and, and that tremendous grace that we have been given in our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to thank you all for continuing to study with me in this epistle. I thank you for all of your your messages, your kind messages of encouragement and support that you leave on the YouTube channel. We've opened up comments, uh, which is something that was recommended, so we decided to go ahead and, and try that. I just want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for your continued prayers, and I want to thank you for your continued support we need your support to keep going. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.